Hi, I'm Bart Massey. I wanted to talk to you today about some of the um, things that you'll encounter as you build your first Rust library. So we're just going to do a real quick video here where we build a Rust library that includes a library dependency and talk a little bit about how Rust's library system actually works. So let's get started with that. I don't think there's much to be done except to say cargo new dash dash lib um, and then we'll give it a name. We have I'm pretty uninspired today so what I've decided to build is a library that given a function from a sequence to a value tries to find the permutation of that sequence that gives the highest value so it's going to be a sequence scoring function. Why? I don't know. I wanted to play with the crate that we're going to use. So, eh, you know, not all libraries have to be special. So let's talk about, but let's talk a little bit about how this would all work. So, um, we'll call it perm score for lack of a better name. And now we've got a thing. Notice that when you create the library with cargo, you use dash dash lib by default, at least in recent releases of Rust. It will build a binary crate, but since we asked it to build a library crate, it did. And now we've got a crate. Let's look at the cargo.toml and see how it differs from one produced by, uh, from a library. And the answer is it doesn't, which is interesting. If you followed some of the other stuff I've done, when we're building a binary, the crate looks, the cargo looks exactly like this. So how does Rust know that it's building a library instead of a binary? Well, the answer is that in the source, instead of main.rs, we have lib.rs, and that is the whole story. Uh, if it sees a lib.rs, Rust assumes you're building a library. And if it sees a main.rs, it assumes you're building an executable. Now, in both cases, you can set the name and the source path to whatever you want in the cargo.toml, but mostly we follow the standard convention and we don't actually do that. So what's this thing in the default library? In a default binary, you'd have a hello world. Here we have just a test in its own module. So Rust's module system is a little fancy. I'll cover it in another video. But the short version is we have this little module that just contains the tests for our library. Of course, we don't have a library yet and this test doesn't meaningfully do anything. But what's this config test? It says only include this item, this mo whole module, if test is set to true in the configuration. And that's something cargo does when you say cargo test, but doesn't otherwise. And so this code will only be included when testing. And that means you can put kind of whatever junk you want inside this module and it will only be compiled when you're testing the program which is nice so we're going to get rid of this for now um and we're just going to think about our interface it's really important when building a rust library that you use cargo doc to document cargo doc comments to rust doc comments to document the library that way people can figure out what's going on with it unlike a binary crate where you know people actually have to go to some work to even see your documentation here you need people to be able to easily see your api and this is the way you do that so what is this thing crate for producing an optimal permutation of a sequence uh let's crate for producing that's kind of terrible obviously it's a crate an op optimal permutation of a sequence produce a permutation of a given sequence with an optimal score according to some given function scoring function sure that's a perfectly reasonable name and now we have to think about the interface of our library so what does the library interface want to look like well the first thing to understand is that things only things marked pub 
are going to be exported as part of our library's API. I can put a function here, uh, and if it isn't pub, then it's still a perfectly good function. I can call it from inside my crate, but I can't call it from outside my crate, so it isn't part of the library API. Um, so what, does I want, what do I want my function to be here? Uh, best perm, that's a terrible name, but I'm going to live with it. And what does it take as arguments? It takes a sequence, which in this case is a slice of values of some type. Well, wait a minute, what are you doing here? Okay, this is parametric polymorphism. I'm not gonna explain it in detail. You can look it up later, but the idea here is that I want this function to work for any type T and I want it to produce a vec T. So I'm gonna actually have it um, give me some permutation of the sequence back, but I also need a scoring function and that gets exciting. Let's see. So this is the most general kind of scoring function. And we're just going to, for the sake of argument, say that the scores are U64s, because I don't want to think about it today. There's probably some better way to generalize that, but we've got enough fancy stuff going on. Um, what does that function take as an argument? It takes a sequence. So what we're gonna do, our outline, is that for each possible permutation of this sequence, we're gonna call this scoring function and we're gonna produce the, return the permutation that has max score. Now to do it in this way, to be able to actually do this, I really think I'm gonna want, um, my type to have some properties. So let's say where T is cloned so that I can make a copy of the thing if I need to. I'm actually gonna work on a mutated copy. And so, and then I'm gonna return a copy at the end. And I sort of feel like that's all I need for an interface. Now maybe I could just stick that in here. That's not considered best rust style, but except for very short things, and this line's already pretty long. Maybe the right way to do it would be like this, which is to break that I had the parentheses wrong. That's a good clue that I should have done this a long time ago. Oh no, NT to U64, and then I need a comma there, or I can have one anyway. Uh, and we'll let Rust format take care of what, what this should look like at the end of the day. But there's our scoring function. Now, how are we going to implement this? Well, let's rough out an implementation real fast. Let's say... Oh, we're gonna need other properties on this. No, I don't think we are. So let's just rough out what we're going to do. And this will be sort of pseudo coding. And there's two ways I could do this. I could do it the fancy functional way, which is probably how I should do it, or I can do it the old school way. And I kind of feel like the old school way is, is what I'm going to do today, just for simplicity. So max score here is a U64. Well, let's not even bother to declare it. So 
so let's do it this way. We're looking for the thing with maximum score, and we know that the initial sequence we're passed in is scorable. Uh, so let's just do that. Um, score seek and let mute max seek equals seek dot into vec. So the into vec here is going to convert, I think it's called into vec, is going to convert this slice, this sequence that we're given in into a vector so that we can uh, return it at the end and now and now for p in uh, permutations of seek if p's score of p is greater than max score then we will do the obvious thing, max score equals, well, let's do a let here because I don't want to score it twice. This might be expensive. Uh, let s equals score of p, uh, max seek equals p dot into vec and at the end we will return maybe we should return both the thing and the score sometimes that's a good idea so let's do that and now let's at the end just return max score max seek and that very briefly is a perfectly legit library function now not quite because where is permutations coming from well i kind of feel like i don't want to write a bunch of code to generate permutations so i'm going to ask for someone else's code for this i'm going to ask for a library function to do this and it turns out the standard library as far as i can remember doesn't have any so we're gonna to go to crates.io. So let's pop crates.io and I search for permutations ordered by recent downloads. And it turns out that, and by the way, recent downloads might be a better order because uh, the search in crates.io isn't for rel by relevance isn't very good. Uh, here's, so we have loom and permutahedron. I've used permutahedron before. I know how to use it. Let's take a look at Loom and maybe we'll try using that instead this time because maybe it's better. The rest of these don't seem super relevant. Loom is a testing tool. No, that's not useful. So let's deal with Permutohedron, which is the most popular, you know, the most recent downloads of any crate that really looks like it does permutations. It looks like it does what you want to do. So this is a crates.io crate. This is what they look like. And what we're gonna do is go look at its documentation, which is all we really care about. We notice the current version is 0.24. And so if we decide to use this, we can just put that version in and we'll be good to go. So how does this thing work? Well, its documentation is maybe not so much or so clear, but it looks like this struct, the heap struct, heaps algorithm, terrible name, heaps algorithm for generating permutations. Yes, it's unfortunate that Dr. Heap had that name, but there we are. And let's look at this and, oh look, a really nice example. So it looks like I can just make a new thing over the sequence, which is exactly what I want a new iterator, and then I can just iterate over the elements in the iterator, and if I go look at the thing, it implements the trait uh, down here at the bottom. It implements the trait iterator. 
That is, it is an iterator. Whoops, where's its trade implementations? That's odd, 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 odd. Trade implementations. Tr size iterator for heat where data is as new slice of T. So the item type is apparently It doesn't give the item type here, but I know the item type is a, is a sequence. So this is exactly what we want. It's almost as though I'd looked ahead. And so let's go ahead and try this thing. So what are the steps of trying this thing? Well, we're going to go back to the Premier Ohedron Rust doc. It says use this as your dependency. So we'll go back to our cargo.toml. and we will depend on permutohedron. And that's pretty much it. I can use its functions now. Now I could put a use declaration up here, but I'm only really gonna use one function out of this crate ever. So I think it's just um, gonna be easier. So that says out of the permutation grate, get a heap struct and use its new method and that should be pretty much it now each of these p's is going to be of type reference to a sequence so that should be pretty much what we need so that quick we're mostly done the one thing we've forgotten, which we should probably do right now before we forget about it, is to put some Rust stock in for what the function does. And best perm's a terrible name here. Max perm. Score, yeah, just max perm. Returns the permuta a permutation. That there might be more than one that achieves the maximum score. I'm going to change these scores to I64. That allows people to mess with negating the scores, um, and I don't think it's going to matter in practice. Score over all permutations of the given input sequence as scored by the scoring function score and that's okayish rust stock we can add some things to make it better. Well, we could add the slashes to make it rust stock. We could add um, an example section. Which would let us then write some rust code. And Yeah, okay, so we'll write a trivial example here. I don't really need to put Rust here, it's the default. So when we do that, for let, um, Uh, what was this crate's name again? So, perm score. So that, that'll be turned it into that. 
max perm and we're going to pass it just this dumb array and I already see a bug as we talk about this but that's okay and for a function we'll just pass a little lambda um, and we're going to go to a new line here one two three four s sub zero times s sub zero plus s sub one times oh what the heck we'll just make it be the cube of the first element the square of the second element and the third element so in this case So now we've got a vector here that's that's array, rearrange these so that this holds and you know the maximum is achieved according to the scoring function and the cool thing about that is that we know what the answer is so we can now finish by writing a test a Insert eek and p and I always put the other thing first and three two one and p right so the permutation oh right but we get both back right right. So we get back a thing and a vector, and the score here should be 3 cubed is 27, plus 2 squared is 4 is 31, 32. There we go. We don't really want a vector here, so we're just going to instead use a thing. I got one more parenthesis here than I need, I guess, maybe. Yeah, okay. So that is our example. Examples are always a good thing. And, oops, I see, I'm still missing a tuple here. And uh, this points out that this code as it stands isn't going to work because permutohedron requires a mutable thing. So we're going to go ahead and swizzle this around a little bit. And I need to make this mutable. And then uh, I want to clone it here. And I want to pass it by mutable address. So this is the cloning thing. And so we have this implicit thing. And notice that we're going to end up with some extra memory allocations because we're going to save copies of the thing but since permutohedron heap actually mutates its sequ underlying sequence uh, there's nothing we can do about that we can't just save references because they might go invalid so we really do have to save and return a vector uh, the sequence is a vector rather than the sequence is a slice so the next obvious thing to do is to see if this builds at all and fix whatever 
things might be a problem. Okay, first problem is right here. Oh, right. It doesn't like this fun mute mute thing here without a dine, and that's not going to work either. <sighs> okay, fine, fine. I've got it a little wrong. So what we're going to have to do is create a function type. Uh, oh, and I've got two copies of this too, so this is garbage. Um, so then f colon fun mute i64 right 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 i don't want to pass an array i don't want to pass a box i just want to pass a closure i want it to leave me alone and that should be better so that should make it whine less and it isn't called into vec it's called to vec and i always get that wrong and i have no idea why i just do Expected and t found a vector. Oh, I see. Really? Does permutahedron return a vector for each element? I did not think it did that. Let's look at the item type or permutahedron again. That's interesting. So let's look at just the source of this. It's easier than looking at the documentation at this point. Type item is data colon owned. Oh, okay. So yeah, if you pass it a slice, you'll get back a vector. So a whole bunch of this cloning and two vecing and stuff doesn't need to happen. I can just do this and not that. And I don't even understand whether I sort of feel like, yeah, maybe that's fine. All right, let's see. The borrow checker will tell us if it's not fine. So let's check it again. As score is mutable, as it is not declared as mutable. Cannot borrow score as mutable. Okay, so if it's going to be declared as fun mute, it has to be declared as mutable. And we're all good to go. So that was easy. Now, here's the interesting thing we can do. Cargo test. Now you may protest. You may say, we didn't write any tests yet. Ah, it turns out we did. This is the miracle of doc tests. This thing is not only an example, but it will actually package it up as a test, run it, and the test will fail if this assert doesn't pass. So let's see if our test, which we wrote by accident while writing documentation, is actually a valid test. Nope, I was afraid of that. Oh, unexpected closed limiter, so it's not even well formatted is the problem. Oh, I see, I closed a curly brace with a thing. Nope. It says expected array of three elements found a vec. I could be more confused. I just don't know how. Oh, I see. Deref didn't actually work. So here it didn't implicitly dereference that thing to a vector because assert eek is a macro. So instead we're gonna have to do something like that to encourage it to turn it into the reference type. Now, what do we get? The trait bound. Oh. Oh. That's odd. Oh. Okay.
Right, it's too many ampersands now. This is interesting. <sighs> All right, we're going to do the gross thing here, which should solve the problem. And we'll talk about why it solves the problem once it, I've proved it actually compiles. Nope. Expected array of three elements found slice. Okay. Okay. I'm not quite sure. Type-wise, I'm not used to having problems like this, so I'm a little puzzled. Let's just do it the obvious way here, because I don't really want to spend all day flailing at this. Rust is Rust type system has its moments for sure. array of three elements found slice. Oh, okay. So the problem is here. It's that this isn't being interpreted as a slice. Uh, okay. So that was where the real problem was. And sometimes when you get problems like this, you just want to do the right thing and just give the types like that. So it was actually the left hand side that it was complaining about. And hey, presto, my math is terrible, but otherwise we're fine. You'll notice that it produced the correct permutation, but what did I say before? 3 squared is 27 plus 4 is 31 plus 1 is 32. So why does my thing on the right produce 34? Four. Huh. I do not understand. Oh, did I screw up? Maybe my code actually has a bug in it. So this is what we wanted to get to. It's the point where we actually have tried a test and it actually failed. And I'm going to guess that I actually stored the wrong sequence somehow or something. Max score is score seek. Score the thing. If S is greater than max score, then that. That sure looks okay, does it not? 27 and 4 is 31 and 1. Oh, copy paste error. Bad tests, bad answer. So, uh,. It turns out the answer was still the same regardless of what that last component was, but I didn't uh, get the right score because I wasn't comparing with the right score. So there we go. And that, folks, is why we run tests, is because dumb copy-paste errors and stuff like that are a part of life. Just because your program compiles and runs doesn't mean it works. So now we've got our thing. We've got our little function that finds the maximum permutation under a scoring function. And what would I use this for? I don't know. I really don't have a great useful use for it offhand. I'm not gonna worry about that today. I should test this more extensively. This test is kind of not great, but I feel like for a simple demo, you get the idea. We provide a public function, and that is our API. And now let's do the other obvious things. Let's run cargo clippy, which says, yeah, this looks fine to me. That's fantastic. Um, 
and I think I can clean this example up a little bit now, by the way. I think I'm, I'm embarrassed by this whole fiasco. So let's try this. Nope, still not okay. Expected slice found struck effect. Okay. Yep. So this little thing is the DREF trick. It's super, super gross. This ampersand star forces the compiler to use the DREF trait to turn that address of a vector into the address of a slice just like it would if it were passed to a function or assigned to a variable of slice type or whatever so that's cleaner uh let's run cargo format but before we get too far let's git commit no git add dot and i have my git ignores set up and there's a standard git ignore set up such that that will do about the right thing and for libraries, I don't want to add the cargo.lock because there's nothing in it that should matter. You really don't want to want the user of your library to have to compile against the version of permutahedron that you used. You want them to compile against the version of permutahedron that they're using other places. So you leave it free and you don't lock it down. Um, but the rest of it needs to be checked in. Uh, permutation max score function library crate. Um, that's a terrible git commit message, but there it is. And now the last things I'm going to do are I'm going to run cargo doc open and look at the documentation I get. Hey, it's the permascore crate. And look at that. We get nice, pretty documentation. And if I click on this function, you'll see our super fancy example that we were so careful to try out. And it's all good. Everybody's happy. Probably can't look at this. It's still too small, but it's going to look like that. Okay, bigger yet. It looks like this, and that is absolutely as pretty documentation as you're going to get for minimal effort. And now we've got a library with one function in it. Notice that it's linked to the permutahedron documentation because we use the permutahedron crate, so I can go look at that as well if I want to, even though I don't expose any of the interface of permutahedron. So that is that. Let's see, is there anything else that needs to be done here? Probably should add a readme and push this whole thing up to GitHub, but I won't do that right now. Oh, right. Cargo format. Let's see if it changed any of my formatting. It did. It didn't like my fancy messing around. It decided this was cleaner, and I'll take that. Took Rust format changes. So now we've checked it with Clippy. We've checked it with test. Which um, we've look, checked that the docs look okay. And we've formatted it. And so it's good to go. And that is that, I think. So thanks for watching. Uh, I'll put the link to the final repo in the comments on this video. Uh, writing Rust library crate, not very hard, kind of fun. And if you have something useful you want to do, then you can write your own. So there we are. Thanks for listening.